just to let you know, I did. Gosh, I just noticed my background. That was from another meeting. I'll just leave it. It'll be fine. Everybody loves a llama, right? Okay. Um, we'll go back over the test. I did go through them the way that it's set up um, with it being not all um, multiple choice or whatever that it, that it would grade itself. I have to go in and input points on you know the discussions and all, so I had to go through each test one at a time. So um, those of you, as you were going through and you uh, missed some that you knew you got right, I've gone back in and, and fixed those things. So um, I knew it would happen, but I knew I was gonna have, have to be looking at each test anyway, so no big deal. Um, it was just case sensitivity. Sensitivity. It was either uh, therapeutic was misspelled, or if I, you know, um, if you had whole house plus anything else for an answer, it would not count as correct, even though you gave the right thing. So, <clears throat> moving forward, if if the next test is the same format and has some questions like that, don't fret. I'll be going through looking at each test and, and making corrections on things like that. So um, I got a lot of emails on it about, hey, I know I got number 18 right. So no worries next time if that happens. So um, I'll wait another couple minutes and we'll me like that. and we'll start in on the um, the test, we'll run through it question by question real quick, and then we'll run through chapter five. I'll go ahead and work on getting that screen up. I'm just gonna open up the test on mine. Like I said, open up those cameras when y'all show up. I appreciate the ones of you that are doing that up front. All right, are y'all seeing the test now? No. Yeah. Okay, good deal. Um, we'll go ahead and start running through that since we've got this in a chapter I wanted to hit. Um, number one was an absolute gimme. Um, just the definition basically of therapeutic recreation and you know that's what we're talking about in this course. Um, so number one was therapeutic recreation. Um, Number two, purposeful recreation. Um, what we were looking for there, explaining what purposeful recreation means, give an example of purposeful recreation in a TR setting. Um, you know, it's providing services that are going to uh, enhance the life of the person you're working with in a positive manner. You're working on a specific deficit that they have to try to improve that. So um, at that point where, where the ones of you who missed points on this, um, who may not have given me a, a specific uh, example of purposeful recreation in a recreational setting, um, or tell me what it was associated with. You know, it's a, you know if you just said um, purposeful recreation could be playing basketball. That could be true, but you need to tell me um, basketball could be purposeful in the fact that we're trying to increase socialization or we're trying to get exercise. If it was something like that, um, it could actually count. You know, uh, a better example is, you know, the one I talked about with using one hand for someone who had a stroke patient to uh, work on hand-eye coordination and strengthen the hand that they had deficits with. So that's what I was looking for on that one. Number three, two criteria used for identifying therapeutic recreation. 
ensuring that the outcomes are grounded in the leisure context and purpose and that it is a purposeful intervention. So it has to be grounded in leisure and it must be purposeful. Number four, another gimme. Understanding past successes and failures helps professionals avoid repeating past mistakes and learn from past successes. That's obviously true. Number five, we talked about the fact that Florence Nightingale was the nurse that um, led to kind of the beginning of therapeutic recreation um, and was tied in with World War I and World War II. Um, I was wanting for her to be mentioned in your uh, essay question later in the test about World War I and World War, World War II um, as far as how did that play into uh, recreation therapy and the birth of it. Number six, Jane Addams was the individual who opened Whole House. <clears throat> and then this should be a gimme right here. It was right after that one. The settlement house in Chicago is Whole House. And as you see, I tried to uh, give plenty of options to where we wouldn't have um, a whole lot of, you know, I got whole house with dashes in between, capitalized, no dash, capitalized and not, you know, I tried to make it where the case specificity wouldn't be uh, too crazy for you guys, but, and for the most part, that question wasn't a big deal. Um, CTRS, we all need to know what that is, Certified Therapeutic Recreation Specialist. Uh, the credentialing agency that oversees someone who wants to be certified as a CTRS is NCTRC, National Council for Therapeutic Recreation Certification. Number 10 in the therapeutic setting, NRPA stands for National Register of Physical Activity. That was false because NRPA stands for what? National Recreation and Park Association. Good job, thank you. Um, number 11, um, you had the best known of all laws protecting those with disabilities. Um, that's pretty straightforward that it was ADA. Um, therefore, the law that indicated any building or facility would have to be the other answer that was that was given there. Um, number 12, professional development. That's straight out of the book. Um, the exact definition of what professional development was in the course. 13, is true, you did have registration and certification are voluntary credentials. Licensure is a situation where it is actually a legal requirement. 14, um, which of the following are included in the five ethical principles covered in the text? And it was all of the above. Um, I had a few people that clicked on just one of them and I, and I hated that, but you needed to recognize that they were all included in the principles. Okay, 15, this is one that people missed. Um, and this was one where I was just asking you to, I mean, the, the test as a whole, you must admit was very easy if you were um, in class paying attention and went over what we talked about prior to the test. So I tried to give you a little bit of something to at least make you, you think here. So which would not be an appropriate focus for a recreation therapist providing services to a patient who has chronic arthritis? And the one that would not be, would be sports and activities that improve cardiovascular conditioning. Uh, the main key is sports and you know to, when you think about cardiovascular conditioning I know that we have elliptical trainers and non-impact things like that and cardiovascular health is important for people who have arthritis but the other two options you know 
you know that swimming takes away weight bearing, you don't have, that's going to be a good situation for um, arthritis. And the arts and crafts using clay, um, that clay was kind of the key in that it can help to work with arthritis in the hands. So that's, that's what that question was about. 16, uh, does having a professional credential make a TR professional more qualified or a better practitioner? We talked about this a bunch. Um, you didn't have a whole lot of ways to, to get it wrong, you know, as long as you justified your answer. Another thing, please, please, please do not leave questions blank. I had people leave some of these essays blank and they're pretty easy essays and they were like 10 points a piece so you leave them blank you're losing a pretty big chunk right there i am um, as you see i'm pretty upfront with how i like to give you the information and and no big surprises um so that being said i'm not trying to i want you guys to do well in the course so give me an answer put something there and i will try really really hard to give you some credit. If it's even in the ballpark, I'll give you, I mean, if two points is better than zero on a 10 point question. So just remember, just answer something. Um, 17, the main difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist is that the psychologist is allowed to prescribe medication for their patients. That's false. The psychiatrist can prescribe medication, not the psychologist. Um, 18, the law or act that mandates that children with disabilities have access to free and appropriate public education is IDEA, Individuals with Disabilities Act. Um, for example, on the case sensitivity, even if you put the individuals with the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it, it, it's going to mark you off. So I'll go in and fix that like I have. Um, 19, uh, clients are given opportunities to make as many decisions and do as many things as they can for themselves. They're only helped to ensure their safety and well-being. Changes and adaptations are made where they need the changes to function as independently as possible. That's least restrictive environment. That is a very important idea in recreation therapy. If we help people too much when they don't need it, um, number one, we won't be empowering them, and number two, we'll actually be holding them back by doing some of that. Twenty, um, the two that are fundamental purposes of accreditation are assuring program quality and assisting in program improvement. A lot of people got, I'll say, or some people I know got. 50% credit on this one, they got one. And most everyone said assuring program quality. And then I had some missed the second portion of that. 21, um, again, straight from the book. And remember you have the materials with you, so you can definitely um, find the information usually on these tests. Um, the application of therapeutic exercise to improve strength, endurance, and mobility of people with physical injuries or limitations um, by employing physical exercise to improve patients' physical condition following stabilization. Again, from the definition in the book, kinesiotherapy was the answer here. Um, I put that on there because it's one that we won't talk about a ton and one that you don't hear about quite as much. So I wanted to make sure that you had gone through and actually looked at that chapter to find that. Um, 22, how did World War One and two contribute to the development of TR as a profession? Um, and I gave a reminder here, 10 point question, so be thorough. So a one sentence answer wasn't gonna get you all 10 points. You know, I was looking for things like what sort of behaviors were happening that they were trying to improve upon by introducing recreation? Um, who was the focal point in this? And we're talking about Florence Nightingale, need to mention Red Cross, you know, military huts, 
things like that. And, and, you know, what happened is they saw by just providing recreation, not even as quote therapeutic recreation by the fact that they were getting recreation that they seemed to be <coughs> improving. So that shows that, you know, prescriptive recreate recreation, you know, for a reason, for specific things is something that could be built upon. And that's kind of how it was the beginning start of um, therapeutic recreation. Everybody good with that? Was that all pretty clear? Wasn't, wasn't too terribly hard. We had a, we had a couple of people make a hundred on it. So it was there to be had um, a lot of nineties. So, I think it was a fair test, if not a little too easy, honestly. So um, let me move on to stop screen sharing for a second. Now let me see if I have, no, let me open chapter five and we will, I'll share that screen in just a second. All right, let's uh, share screen and we'll talk about chapter five. Okay, y'all got the PowerPoint up now? Okay, good deal. So this one, uh, we're talking about therapeutic recreation. Uh, what are some places where you could practice? What are some of the different models that have been brought forth about therapeutic recreation and what are some different modalities that are used in practice and we'll talk about modalities and kind of what that is so as far as this this learning outcome slide is pretty good it gives you a good indicator for each chapter of, of what we're looking for out of the chapter at the end of it you should be able to do these things so uh, the top one there, it's basically where can you get a job? Where are the potential places of practice? Um, some models of practice again. There's uh, some philosophical differences and similarities across the different models. And models are basically just ideas or framework for providing therapeutic recreation, you know, that people have come up with. There are different paths that you can base what you're doing on no specific one is correct. They're just all different ideas. Um, we'll talk about commonly used therapeutic recreation modalities and modalities. Does anybody from the sound of this sentence, does anybody know what modality, what an easy word for that would be? I'll make it simple. It's um, tools, activities, games. It's basically what we use to help our clients are the modalities. It's just a fancy word for it. And we'll talk about potential applications for special, you know, specific populations. What tools or modalities do we use with who? All right, settings. Um, this is an old number, but um, uh, I'm not even going to share it. It's too old. Hospitals are a setting for therapeutic recreation, either in acute care, outpatient, psychiatric, rehabilitation hospitals. Um, especially um, rehabilitation hospitals are a good area for therapeutic recreation specialists to work. Nursing homes, very large need there. Um, if you think about nursing homes and you think about what, uh, what the people that are living in the nursing homes need, uh, their days, you know, for a lot of them are either spent in their room or just 
sitting in the hall in their chair or uh, they need recreation therapy. They need socialization. They need some sort of entertainment and fun that's going to benefit them, even if it's just through socialization and putting a smile on their face. And that's where uh, the nursing home setting is a great setting for TR. Municipal therapeutic recreation settings. This was like when I worked for the Park Commission for a couple of years, I worked with individuals who uh, were 50 and over. We did aquatic therapy, we did uh, water aerobics, we had groups that played dominoes, we had line dancing classes, yoga, Pilates. Uh, we put together a, quite a good group of activities for people that were 50 and older, and that was in a municipal setting, working actually for the Park Commission. Some other places we've talked about already, some of these correctional facilities, camps, wilderness therapy, you know, for people that are um, interested in the outdoors and things like that, that's a good idea. Schools also have recreation therapy in some of the more progressive settings. The um, practice models. The first one we'll talk about is the leisure ability model. I'm not going to ask you who it is by, who came up with it, you know, Peterson Guns, Dumbo Peterson, don't worry about that. Um, there are three sections of their model. And like I say, this is just a framework for the delivery of therapeutic recreation. Number one, it's going to be a functional intervention. And an intervention is going to be for us where we're looking for an improvement. And we want it to be either physical, mental, social, or emotional. And you need to know those four areas because those are the areas that we actually address in recreation therapy. It can be any of those, physical, mental, social, emotional. Also, um, there's leisure education where you have leisure awareness. Um, some people that we work with, uh, especially let's say when I was at the North Mississippi Regional Center and I was working with developmental disabilities, they needed leisure awareness. They didn't know what leisure activities they could do. They didn't know what was available to them. Um, leisure resources. Um, you either help them to find resources. It may be a ride to get to where they need to get to, to participate in an activity. Um, it may be where they can get information about how to play a game or how to do a specific activity, uh, where they could get equipment if they needed it to participate in something. Um, also, you talk about social skills as, you know, with my seven-year-old boy when he started playing baseball he got absolutely pissed off every time somebody else on his team would catch the ball i mean he would so he didn't realize that they were on his team at first <laughs> you know he, he he thought since he didn't catch it he lost and that's you know of course a lot of that is just being young and i was glad to see that he was competitive on that but at the same time, he needed to realize that uh, socially, that's inappropriate behavior to get mad at your teammate for catching the ball. That doesn't exactly fly. So um, also activity skills, that's where we actually teach people how to participate in activities. You know, what's teaching them how to do it. And the other step is recreation participation where once you've gone through, I mean, this is kind of a stepwise process. You know, you look to see what you need to intervene on as far as fun physical, mental, social, or emotional. See how you're going to work with that. Then they have to have the leisure education. And once they know what's available, they've learned the, you know, gotten the proper skills and you've had a chance to work on that, then they can actually participate in recreation. Um, the next is the health protection, health promotion model. Again, I'm not worried about who came up with it. Um, they did 
Basically, they use Therapeutic Rec to help patients recover following uh, threats to their health. That, that, this is what health protection and health promotion is about. Uh, using Therapeutic Rec to help them recover following threats to health and achieve as high a level of health as possible. That's the health promotion side of it, is trying to achieve that highest level. The first portion that I said is the health protection where you're helping them to recover or get better where they have a problem. So this one is more based on the actual health of the patient, not as much on the psychological, mental side of things as the previous model might, might have been. Um, we do prescriptive activities to help clients regain control. Um, recreation in this setting is seen, seen as being naturally restorative, you know, as a positive. Um, and then health is where you are trying to help them to, you know, promote health moving forward. This one is not as clearly written out on the slide, but it's in the book a little better. So as you're going through, take a little time to be able to recognize these different models for the next test because I think we'll ask questions about different models and what they're about, be able to recognize them. Recreation service model. Um, it attempted to, uh, attempts to integrate therapeutic recreation services into the wider system of healthcare delivery. So I like this one. I like all of them in their own way. Um, <clears throat> this one basically is kind of like, hey, we're here, we can help too. We're an integral part of healthcare delivery. Therapeutic recreation can help people get better, you know, sometimes better than other sorts of therapy. Um, just depending on the person and the situation. It's based on the World Health Organization model of healthcare service, and um, the therapeutic recreation services are provided within the context of the World Health Organization model. So we, it, we go, um, the World Health Organization model has diseases, impairments, disabilities, and handicap handicaps in their definitions of, in their model. And people are put into different groups according to that. And therapeutic recreation services, when they're provided, they're not only provided, they're, the bottom one you can add and build. Therapeutic recreation services are then to be provided and build within the context of this model. So you're, that, it's one that led a little bit toward um, the money side of therapeutic recreation because they're put into this system where billing is, you know, everyone else is billing. So we want to be able to bill for what we're doing as well. So again, modalities, we've talked, I've used that word a little bit today. It's not, it's a big fancy word for the things that you'll see below. Um, a treatment modality is just something that, that we can use to enhance our client's well-being, whether again, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, any of the areas that we talked about. Um, some of these that can be used, games, now that's a wide open box right there. There's tons of different games that are appropriate for different people. Um, there's games that challenge the mind. There's games that challenge you physically. There's games that work on hand-eye coordination. There's games that make you laugh, that you know help with that, with depression and things like that. Exercise, the same thing, another wide open area where there's so many different ways that you can help someone get exercise. And depending on what uh, level they are and where their needs are, a type of exercise needs to be individualized to that particular person. Um, parties, obviously, you might not think of that as a recreation therapy tool, but in recreation therapy, something I always saw when I was in the field working, um, holidays and all were kind of a big deal. 
and especially think about in like the nursing home setting. Um, again, these people are away from their families for the most part, they, especially now during this whole COVID climate and all that. Um, so you make a big deal about the 4th of July and you put up, you know, streamers and red, white, and blue balloons and things like that. And, and Christmas and other holidays such as that, um, parties can be tied in to holidays, you know, they give you a theme and they're a good opportunity to work on socialization, improving mood, things like that. Arts and crafts, they're a good way for people to um, get their thoughts and feelings out in a way that's not necessarily speaking. This is good for people who may not want to talk, but they may be able to release some of this through doing arts and crafts. Also, it's, a, it's good for working on, you know, hand-eye coordination, things like that as well. You know, if you think about different populations that may have trouble with that, if you have them working, you know, say you were doing an activity where you were making bead bracelets where they're having to put the little beads on the strings. Um, that's obviously going to work on fine motor skills and things like that that may be a deficit. We talked about least restrictive environment. So our goal, obviously, is that we want people to be able to do as much as they can in the um, community and for themselves. So especially if you're in a setting where they're there for rehabilitation, um, uh, think about alcohol and drug rehabilitation centers. That's another one that was not named there. That's a good, good, good place for a recreation therapist to work also, and a very interesting place for a recreation therapist to work, but challenging because of the people that you're working with. You know, a lot of them don't feel good, don't want to participate. You must be a good motivator to work there, but it's a kind of a good place. Um, but in a situation like that, if they're there for rehab, they're going to be put back out into the community, into the real world after a certain amount of time. And what you want is, for, is to provide them with recreation and leisure outlets that you work with them there while you have them that when they go back out into the real world, they can kind of replace those bad behaviors that they were there for to start with, with good things that you've taught them. That's kind of what you're looking for there. Um, same thing with developmentally delayed or something like that. If they, once you have had the opportunity to teach them uh, recreation, activities and outlets and things that they can do you want them to be able to continue with these things once they once they leave your care music we all know that that is a wonderful tool to use as a as a modality music can totally change your mood music has gotten me a speeding ticket before um music will uh in a nursing home setting where you have you know may have some dementia i've seen videos and i've seen it in person where um, music is a sense of nostalgia for a lot of people and you can play a song and it takes them back to where they were at a certain time and it may put a smile on their face because it reminds them of their wedding day 55 years ago you know or uh, anything else i've seen uh videos where people who have, you know, severe de dementia, they don't know people's names, they're rarely talking anymore, and you play certain music and they'll just start singing every word to it. So music is powerful and it can be used in a lot of ways, even if it's just in the background while you're doing something else, as long as it's not interfering with what you're doing. Problem solving activities, they're a good opportunity for people to have a chance to realize, hey, when I come across a problem, I can work this out. It gets them to work with other people as well. You know, you can have some teamwork, team building sort of things. 
and and it helps their self-esteem when they see that they're they've been able to be successful on problem solving activities so when you're providing that particular modality you want to be careful with the difficulty of the problem solving activity that you're giving them and make sure that it is challenging yet attainable if you see what i'm saying there you want it to be if it's too easy it's almost going to be demeaning to them you know if it's too hard they're going to feel defeated at the end but and that's where you have to find through and and you would learn through experience on this um finding the correct amount of challenge sports can be a modality for tr um, self-esteem activities anything that can help improve someone's mood self-esteem self-concept that's why it's important like i was saying to give them things that they can be successful in that's going to uh, when someone reaches a goal even if it's a small goal your self-esteem is going to go up just that little bit pretty much for everybody so that's a plus and then activities of daily living now as a recreation therapist for the most part we talked about what what we do and what we offer in these modalities um, sometimes as a recreation therapist we have to teach some things that can play into daily living and when i think about activities of daily, daily living some of the first things that come to my mind are you know showering brushing our teeth hair things like that that's that's a little beyond where i'm going with this but uh, for example when i was at the regional center i used to take clients on community outings or trips periodically we would go to memphis redbirds games we would go to grizzlies games we would go to wrestling oh my god the clients out there loved some wrestling um <clears throat> but and that's all fine and good but a lot of the clients were either elderly um some were kind of like scared of heights um and they had trouble with stairs um that that's a problem you know if you go to an event like this and your seats are on the 60th row um you got to be able to go up steps so I actually we had some we had a stage at the regional center and there were um, steps that you could put on each side of the stage and what I did with some of my classes uh, the older groups um, I set up the steps facing each other together where it was steps that went up and then down the other side and I had talked to my clients about how you know, I want to be able to take you on some of these events, but if we're going to do this, you got to be able to do steps. So we're going to work on that today. And we worked on going up and down steps. It may sound boring, but it served a purpose. And it actually helped a good bit because they got to where they felt confident that they could handle the steps for several of them. Um, I had some that had trouble getting in and out of a van. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but, uh, I had times where I would work with a client getting in and out of the vehicle. Because when you're trying to do a trip and you've got a group, um, they need to be able to do these things. So those are daily living skills that you can work on as a recreation therapist that can help them, not just with you, but in the long run. Just something to kind of think about. Um, Table five one in the book, you guys need to, let me look at it and see. I'm gonna pull that up real quick and see if I can give you some specific examples of what I'm talking about here. All right, it has things like if you're working in with physical rehabilitation, mental health, older adults, and other populations, what are some of the most common modalities that would be used for 
those groups. It's a good little table. It gives you some ideas. Um, say on the next test, if you had a question about, you know, what would be an appropriate modality to use for an older adult who has trouble with this or that. Um, 5-1 is a good place to look. 5-2 is actually really good. It has uh, some different modalities and what category they are in, um, what you see as a positive from them, and who are some good populations to use them with, and what some good goals could be. Um, aquatics, exercise, sports, Tai Chi, sensory stimulation, medical, play, dance, and movement. They are all on there. Then it goes on over to the next page with storytelling, arts and crafts. You need to look at 5-1 and 5-2. Um, as a therapeutic recreation specialist, you're not going to come straight into the field and have all the skills to be awesome at everything, but you need to be proficient at using a lot of different interventions because your clientele are going to be individuals they're, and, and they're, what they get from you needs to be individualized for them to help them personally and we'll talk more about that as we go into the next chapter which is a lot of uh, important information about how recreation therapy really works so next class is a big deal important class for sure just throwing that out there so as a tr specialist you need to be able to as it says here above table five two on the slide um, you need to be able to identify potential modalities what are some things that i have available to use with my clients um, ensure that they're appropriate for the client goals you know, you don't want to work on um, something that's going to promote weight loss with someone who is already underweight, you know, common sense sort of thing there and be able to implement them in a competent manner. So you need to know what you're doing, what you're talking about, because you're teaching them while they're doing these things. Some common modalities in rehabilitation. Um, something important here um, is something called active treatment. I brought it up before and it's something that uh, your surveyors that come in to facilities to make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's what one of the main things they're looking for is active treatment. So, you know, Again, I hate to keep using the thing, just rolling out a basketball and saying, okay, play. You're not providing activity therapy or, or recreation therapy. It's not TR. It's just uh, recreation, basically. There's um, no specific goal. It's not individualized, things like that. So it's not really what you're looking for. Um, so community reintegration is something else you can work on with your clients. Um, you want to reduce the stigma of people who have issues that need to be reintegrated in, in, into the community. Give them some real world practice um, and help them find community resources that they can use when they get back out into the quote real world. Um, games. Um, a good thing to do with games if you are dealing with uh, clients, you need to have some sort of goal that you're working on that's that you're able to document therapeutic outcomes. You know, what are they getting out of this? How can you document that they're getting what you're looking for? Because <clears throat> if, if you're not able to do that, then you're probably not providing something that is therapeutic if you can't track whether or not it is actually therapeutic. Arts and crafts, we talked about that. Problem solving helps them work on self-esteem and teamwork. Um, exercise, we all know the benefits of exercise. 
you know, we're talking about rehabilitation here. So specific exercises work on specific areas or specific, you know, cardiovascular or strength gains if that, that you're looking for. You can do different sorts of exercise to hit the goals that you're looking for. Um, let's see. Okay, there's some more that are gonna be presented in chapter eight. That's about it for that slide. Okay, that was for rehabilitation and mental health. Some of the same ones are here. When you're dealing with people who have um, either developmental disabilities where their IQ is low or mental illness, they would both be considered mental health situations. These are some common modalities or tools that can be used with them. Games, self-esteem experiences. Um, you think of someone, uh, we'll just say bipolar, um, where you have highs and lows. If someone is in a, a series of lows, if you can help their self-esteem, you may help to kind of slow that cycle and, and help them feel better about themselves. Problem solving, we've talked about the benefits, exercise, arts and crafts. Um, that's a good, that's, that's something you can use with almost anyone, depending on as long as you make it age appropriate and something that they'll enjoy doing. It's a good way to have them. And at the end, they have something tangible that they can keep which for a lot of your clients, that will be a good thing. You know, if you're working with younger, younger kids or something, they love to have something they can take home. Um, if you're working with the elderly, it gives them something they can put in their room. They don't have a whole lot of decorations, a lot of them. So things like that need to be thought of. Uh, we'll talk more about mental health in chapter 10. For older adults, I talked earlier about how music is nostalgic a lot of times. Um, they reflect on things that happened in the past, um, memories and fun things that they used to do. Um, like I said, when I was at the park commission, I was actually, I know I look like a water aerobics instructor, the typical water aerobics instructor, I'm sure. But um, actually I was during my time there, I taught them water aerobics and I came out there the first time and I put a little playlist together for them to have going in the background and boy, did I get some complaints after that first day. I was not hitting my clientele with what they wanted to be hit with as far as music. So the next time we had class, we were listening to, uh, I think I had it on Pandora or something like that. And it was like fifties and sixties hits. And boy, they were happy with me then. They liked that stuff. That They were singing and everything else. It was a whole different vibe once they got the music that they wanted. Um, again, with older adults, parties are a good choice. Games, exercise, a lot of them don't get hardly any exercise. And you may be talking about, we're not talking hardcore, you know, hour on the treadmill at five miles per hour. We're talk we may be talking about walking up and down the hall with them and talking about how their day's going you know, getting them to do something that's gonna benefit them. Arts and crafts again, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about older adults in chapter 12. I like this chapter because it starts to lay the framework of what we do and how we do it. Now on these discussion questions that are here, just something to think about, um, why have many therapeutic recreation service models been proposed? You know, what comes to mind when I, when I look at that is the fact that, you know, like I said, none of the models that we named today are perfect. We went over three or four different ones and they all are just basic framework for you to kind of, you can build your ideas from. Um, you know, somebody didn't necessarily love one of the models, so they were like, hey, let me make my own. 
So there's been different models made because no one is correct. You know, you can have, there could be more models added today. Um, <clears throat> something to think about which one of the models that we talked about, and this seems like a decent, I'll just throw this out here. This seems like a decent essay question for another test. If we do the next test on the same sort of format, um, which therapeutic recreation service model in this chapter appears to be the most useful. I like it because it gives you a little bit of thought and you should like it because if you give me an answer that's naming one of the models and gives me some sort of reason, I would probably add why at the end, why would you say it's the most useful? You're giving me something that's more or less an opinion. I just want you to think and give me some information. So if I put this on the test, don't leave it blank. Um, <clears throat> the next one I like too, in which therapeutic recreation setting would you most like to work? It's a good question. I find out a little bit about you guys from it. Um, we talked about schools. Um, a few of you tell me where you would like to work if you were in a therapeutic recreation setting. We got almost 50 of us here. I need five people to tell me where you would prefer different places. Summer camp. All right, I like it. Maybe a hospital. Uh-oh, same time. Somebody try again. Hospital. Hospital. A school. School, yes. It would, does the um, correctional side of things uh, interest anybody? Does that seem like something that you would enjoy? I would like that. I think, it, I think that would be very interesting. And, and um, I mean, it would, have, it would have to be a certain person, you know, you'd have to have the personality for it for sure. But you think about, you know, correctional facilities, they, they need, you know, they give them the opportunity for recreation and recreational outlets. And so some specific recreation that's being done for a purpose to work on, you know, bad behaviors, things like that. You could see how correctional facility would be a good place for recreation therapists. It's not, that's growing. It's something that's not super common at this point, but I like that. Um, military bases have recreation therapists. Like we talked about on the last test, you know, they saw in World War One and Two where recreation is a positive. So that's another place. So something to think about also from this chapter moving forward is, you know, how do you choose which modalities or which uh, tools you're going to use with your clients? You know, uh, again, that table five two is a, would be a good help on that. It talks about the different different things that you could do and who they would be best to use them with. I don't need you to to memorize the whole chart, but I would like you guys to go and look at five dot one and five dot two in the book, and it's page seventy one. Um, And I think that that covers most of what I wanted to get today. We actually got a good bit covered today. Um, anybody have any questions, thoughts, issues at all? You good? Okay, well, we're gonna go over chapter six in the next class. Let me make sure it's the class that I'm thinking it is. Yes, and it actually, we're going to talk about the therapeutic recreation process. It is, um, to me, it's exciting because it's, it's the meat and potatoes. It's the bones of what we do in recreation therapy. How do we put it all together? How do we plan things? How do we see whether it's working or not? Things like that. So it's a good chapter. If you want to look at it ahead of time, you can. If you want to look at it after, you can do that. But um, that's what we're going to cover next class.
I appreciate you guys being here. I hope you have a good rest of the day, and I will see you guys on Thursday. Y'all have a good one. Later, guys. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, you too.